we've really needed this, haven't we? This opportunity to come together at the end of a year like this and to sing and to worship and to celebrate and to laugh. I think uh, one of my favorite Christmas carols, Oh Holy Night, uh, I felt a line of that uh, carol resonate with me that I've never felt the weight of it like I did this year. A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. But that just hit me. I mean, a weary world. It just feels like absolutely this year, the world is weary. And we needed this, this reminder that at the end of the day, everything is going to be okay. Amen? For you on the breaks, a new and glorious morn. So, you know, these Christmas carols that we sing are all songs written after the birth of Jesus, reflecting on what Jesus would mean for the world. But there were some songs written before the birth of Jesus that predicted what the coming of Jesus would mean for the world. We have a few of them in the Gospels. I want to have a look at one of them tonight. It is a song sung by Mary herself after the angel Gabriel visits her and tells her that she's about to give birth to this child. And she sings this song. So it's in Luke chapter 1, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. We're going to have a look at Mary's song, which is technically the very first Christmas carol ever written or sung. And reading from verse 46, it says, And Mary said, or really Mary sung, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So this is a song. And how do you imagine this song going? We don't have a tune for the song, but what does it sound like if we had to sing this at a Christmas carol service? I mean, think about it. You have this young teenage girl, probably 14 years old or so, uh, pregnant and visiting her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country. When she meets her, they have this great greeting, and then she breaks out into the song. What would this song sound like? It's, it's got to be a sweet-sounding song, right? Like, pretty song. Let me tell you that this song is a revolutionary song. In the early 1900s, when missions societies sent out missionaries, in particular to countries where there was a lot of poverty, they recommended that this scripture, this song of Mary, not be read aloud for fear of it inciting revolt. In Guatemala in the 1980s, not too long ago, the oppressive regime forbid that this text be read in public. Just have a look at some of the topics of this song. Verse 15, 51, she starts off singing about theology, about God, and then moves on to ethics. From there, in verse 52, she sings about politics. Right, he has brought down rulers. So really, this is no longer polite dinner party conversation. And by the way, it's because of these, this exact line that oppressive regimes forbid this being spoken out loud. And then in verse 53, she starts speaking about economics. She says, he has filled the hungry, satisfied them, but sent the rich away empty. Which again would make certain societies nervous. 
Now, suppose whenever we read the Bible and we come across language like this, particularly language like hungry and being filled and being satisfied, we've got to ask ourselves, does God mean here something literal, like he's literally going to you know, fill all the hungry, satisfy them, feed all the hungry, and the rich will go empty-handed? And we have to ask this question because if you've you know, been around a Bible for a little while, you know that kind of the idea of being hungry is a metaphor often used to describe spiritual longing. For example, Jesus will say in John chapter 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. It's the same kind of language. What's interesting in this passage is Jesus has just literally physically fed 5,000 people miraculously, and then he says this, and what he means is that as he has fed the hungry, he's trying to point them towards a far deeper, more urgent spiritual hunger. So when you read this, it's correct to stand back and go, yes, words like hungry and being filled and satisfied do point towards a spiritual need. However, if we look back in the history of the church and we see the impact that Christianity has had on the world, especially in the early years, we start to see that actually when people started living like the way Jesus taught them to live, things happened very much in line with what Mary was singing about in a very literal, physical sense. Let me give you just one example. I wish I could give you so many more. But one example of the early impact of Christianity in the Roman world, so when the church first started, at that time, certain classes, certain groups of people, very undervalued slaves, of course, one of them, not much higher than slaves, were children. In fact, so low was the Roman view of children that it was, there was this practice called exposure that was legal, which basically said that if you decided before your child was eight years old, that you no longer wanted eight years or eight days old, you no longer wanted that baby, you could just discard of it. You just leave it. They would leave these eight day old babies on these dung heaps and just leave them to die in this practice known as exposure. Children were considered literally like plants. You could just have them and water them or you could choose not to do that. And then Jesus came and Jesus started saying things like, let the children come to me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And, so the, and many other things regarding children. And so as the movement of Jesus started and the followers of Jesus embraced this and started to value children when the Romans practiced exposure Instead of leaving the babies on dung hills, they would leave them outside the doors of churches because they knew the followers of Jesus valued children. That is how orphanages were started. Hospitals, universities trace their roots back to the early Christian movement, the abolition of slavery in William Wilberforce in the United Kingdom, the rights of women and other massive societal corrections were made by the early Christians. In other words, the followers of Jesus turned the world upside down, or should I say, turned the world right side up. So when Mary sings these kinds of revolutionary words, yeah, it's true. Actual systems of power and injustice were corrected. And actual economies would be reoriented from a concern just for personal accumulation of wealth to a concern for the poor. This is what Mary was singing about in this revolutionary song. So the song is a song about a spiritual hunger, but it is also a song about a physical hunger. It's a passage about a revolution that would happen in the world, but also a revolution that happens inside 
every person. And here's the thing, though. The revolution in the world would happen because of the revolution happening inside the hearts of believers. Christianity begins a revolution on the inside which leads to a revolution in the world on the outside. So let me tell you how this revolution starts on the inside. It starts with grace. The idea of grace is fundamentally revolutionary because it makes no sense and it is not practiced anywhere in the world outside of Christianity. Let me just think about this time of year. That's right, so a Christmas time. And yeah, as parents, you have the opportunity for just a couple of weeks to coerce your kids to behaving well by saying, if you're good, then Santa will reward good behavior by giving you gifts. And even in the workplace, bonuses are given as a reward for hard work in the year. Although this will be like, what is a bonus? See, the world knows nothing of this idea of grace. Grace, by definition, is unmerited, undeserved favor. It is giving somebody every good gift, no matter how bad they were. And this is how God treats us. Grace, it's the heart of the Christian message. Romans 5, verse 8 says, For while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we had made ourselves appealing or when we had proved that we were worthy, then God sent this incredible gift. While we were sinners, Christ died for us as a demonstration of the unconditional love that God has for us. The summary of the gospel, the good news message of Christianity. Jesus takes our sinfulness, we receive his perfect righteousness. He then suffers and dies in our place and we receive a glorified eternal life. And all of that happens completely undeserved. All we do is receive it. It's grace. It is revolutionary. And this is what, this is the idea that stuns Mary in her song. This is what's so clear about what she's singing about. When she says in verse 48, for he, for God has looked on the humble estate of his servant, She's literally saying that she feels she is lower than the lowest rung on the ladder, and yet God sees her. That's what she's so stunned about. Why would God choose me? And she's not exaggerating when she considers herself so lowly. Remember, she's a poor, young girl betrothed to a carpenter who belonged to a hated race living in a forgotten village in a forsaken part of the Roman Empire. And yet God has seen her and he who is mighty has done great things for me. When do the mighty ever do things for the lowly? She's stunned that God would choose her. This is the best news in the world because you might feel like you are lower than the lowest rung on the ladder. And Christmas comes and reminds us that in fact, God is at home with the lonely, 
the lowly, the lost, the weak, the broken, the brokenhearted, the excluded, the exploited. God sees them. The ones who cannot be helped, the ones who can't be helped, they're the proud. That's why she'll say in verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he sent away empty. It doesn't mean God somehow values the poor more than the rich because that would not be grace. What she's speaking about is the truth that often the rich and the powerful are so self-sufficient and independent, they don't realize they have a need for anything. And so to them, the idea of grace is not only does it not make sense, but it's unfair, it's unpalatable, it's repulsive, and they reject grace and reject the gospel. That's what she's saying. But to those who receive it, who gladly, like Mary, receive grace, transformation happens. A revolution happens on the inside. These are some of the most hopeful words in the Bible when Mary says, for behold, from now on, from now on, did you hear that? From now on, all generations will call me blessed. That is the dignity of transformation, the revolution that comes your from now on story is radically different to whatever happened before. From now on. I wonder what those words mean to you tonight. From now, from now on, I will no longer be filled with anger. From now on, I will no longer mistreat, take for granted my spouse. From now on, I will no longer be bound captive to materialism or whatever it is that has you captive. From now on, this is the revolution that happens to our story. And it becomes a different kind of story, a story described by what Mary calls blessed. From now on, they will call me blessed. And before you get too carried away, blessed does not mean what maybe society or social media says today. When you put hashtag blessed, that's generally a humble brag, something great, you've achieved something or got something cool. That's not what she means. Just look at what it meant for Mary, literally in her story. And she says, now they call me blessed. What actually happened in her physical life? She remained poor. In fact, her friends and her neighbors started to look on her with disgrace because she was pregnant and not married. And Mary would undergo the unspeakable grief of watching her child be rejected, shamed, tortured, and crucified. And yet, Mary praises God for honoring her, hashtag blessed. That's revolutionary. That's revolutionary. And that is why a revolution happens in the world because of the followers of Jesus. It's just very different. You become a follower of Jesus. All of a sudden, your priorities and concerns are changes. And what becomes important is following Jesus and living the way Jesus taught and serving Jesus in the kingdom of Jesus with self-sacrificial servant-heartedness. And that leads to the revolution in the world. The world being turned right side up. Christianity begins a revolution on the inside, which leads to a revolution on the outside. We're going to have some time to process this a little bit. I'm going to call up Isabella, sans Rosie, to sing for us a song about being born in me. And after that, we're going to have an opportunity to pray together.